This program is made possible by grants from Exxon Corporation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm in the backstage area of the building that is the northernmost performing hall in the Lincoln Center Complex, Alice Tully Hall, and it is the home of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. We're in the middle of a whole week devoted to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and at, the, at this uh, midweek point, the Chamber Music Society has chosen to give us a unique television opportunity to compare the playing of Bach's music in the way that it would have been heard in his own time in the early part of the 18th century on the instruments of that time with contemporary interpretation of the same pieces on modern instruments. I could say that the uh, Chamber Music Society scoured the world to find the best group to play in the ancient manner, but the truth of it is there was precious little scouring required because it's well understood that the most exciting group in the world today committed to playing the music out of that extraordinary fruitful period we call the Baroque is uh, Christopher Hogwood's Academy of Ancient Music from London. And so the Chamber Music Society has brought Mr. Hogwood and the Academy over here for this evening's concert, for this week as well. It's a kind of antiphonal concert except that the two voices separated by just a few feet on the stage are also separated by about 250 years in time. And to find out exactly how the trick is going to be done, let's go on stage now in Alice Tully Hall. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Charles Wadsworth, and I think tonight's concert is a first of its kind. This evening will give us the opportunity to hear back-to-back -back performances by the Academy on unaltered instruments and the Society on modern and or altered instruments. Now, the sound <coughs> and appearance of the old and modern wind instruments will be fairly obvious, but the contrasts are much more subtle on the strings. There are differences in the interior construction of these instruments and the fingerboard measurements. Gut strings are used primarily on the old and the more brilliant metal strings on the altered instruments that the society plays. The big difference in approach and sonority comes from the difference in bows. The old bows are shorter and because of the design, the hairs are strung with much less tension than on the modern bow. Therefore, the attacks, accents, changes from loud to soft, soft to loud, to the phrase shapes, all these are dictated to a large extent by this factor of the bow. In the Baroque period, instruments were tuned a, a pitch a lower, half step lower, than today's tuning. So, you will hear what sounds like a change of keys, but it ain't so. <laughs> One of the most important and difficult subtleties to recognize and hear is that the Academy from London plays on standard time, whereas the Lincoln Center Group plays <laughs> on Eastern Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> now, I have some very important, I'm serious about this, I have some very important ground rules to set off the contrast more clearly. First, the Academy of Ancient Music will be here in the white jackets. <laughs> the, chamber, the Chamber Music Society will be here in black, all black. Each of the three works in the first half of this concert will be played two times. Hold your applause until the second version is completed <laughs> after each piece. Do not interrupt between the first and second version of each piece. Don't be frustrated by not getting to applaud for one of the other versions because each player knows in his heart that you're applauding just for him. After the, f after the first work is finished, you're going to have a real treat because Christopher Hogwood of London will come out to tell you 
some other aspects of Baroque performance. You're going to love it because he talks so pretty. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you have a great evening.
Hi. Now you've heard those two samples from either side of this stage. I perhaps ought to say what we are not doing this evening. In the first place, we are not a sort of musical Wimbledon. <laughs> um, there are no McEnroe's. There may be Charles Wadsworth as a sort of linesman, as ultimate referee. But it's not, I'm afraid, although described as such, a battle. And I hope there will be no blood shed or blows thrown. I think one has to more regard the sort of display of artworks, as it were, in this one, as similar to furnishing a room. It's the sort of choice you would have maybe between furnishing your sitting room in Chippendale or the latest folding plastic and perspex <laughs> chairs. I make uh, no suggestion that this is a Chippendale flute. <laughs> On the other hand, I think one does tend to get rather Darwinian about uh, musical instruments. Uh, there's a, an idea that they've been getting better and better and better ever since they were first invented, and therefore the latest must be best. Unfortunately, this sometimes goes hand in hand with a counter-religion which says only the old is good and possible, and I hope what we can display this evening will show that both exist very happily side by side and both do very different jobs. As you can see from the two instruments here, for example, the 18th century flute is a very simplified affair. It is wood, it has one key only. Um, it plays when it plays in D major, in this tonality. And the modern flute, with many, many more keys made of metal, plays in the same tonality, sounding so. Obviously, they can't exist side by side. <laughs> there are various reasons. <laughs> there are various reasons for these developments, of course. An instrument exists within um, a framework of requirements. The context for the Baroque flute required it to do certain things in a certain tone. It had this marvelous tone resulting from it being a wooden instrument. It wasn't asked to play very chromatic solos um, in a Stravinsky piece. This is uh, the prerequisite of the modern instrument. The repertoire we ask from a modern symphonic instrument nowadays will perhaps cover two centuries, two and a half centuries. You have to have a flute that can play both your Bach and your Bartok, your Stravinsky and your Brahms. Whereas somebody who chooses to play the Baroque flute will automatically be limited to the repertoire of that period, but also have access to some of the sounds and techniques of that period which are no longer available to the modern player. But don't go with the idea that all you have to do is put the instrument into somebody's hands, and that gives you a quotes authentic rather than a quotes inauthentic performance. There is no uh, moral rule in music at all. You can do what you like to it, and it depends on the player as much as on the material. It's the cook not the ingredients. So we can follow some of these mechanical changes in other instruments, but we must also trace some of the other elements that have to be in your mind when you are giving a performance of Bach or Brahms or Bartok. Take, for instance, the oboes. They make the same comparison. The modern oboe, the old oboe, I hasten to say both players are the same age. I'm only <laughs> referring to the <laughs> instrument. A genuine 18th century oboe with two keys, the rest is open, holes, fingered. The modern oboe with I can't tell you how many keys, designed not as an improvement on the original, but to change the tuning that came naturally. The mean tone tuning of the Baroque oboe is one of its beauties. It is only, of course, appropriate in the repertoire for it, which it was designed. The modern oboe has to cope with all repertoire and consequently is that much more mechanized. You gain something, you lose something as well as these mechanical improvements that you can find throughout the orchestral instruments, you have also the requirements of style. And that's one element I think you've probably heard already, the differences of approach, not so much in the sonorities of the two versions of the Sinfonia we've played, but the way we've added notes in many cases. There's a certain 
uh, area where things were never notated in music. It occurs, for example, in the keyboard part, which is not written. That's an improvised part based on the string bass line. What I was doing, what Ken was doing, came entirely out of our heads. And you can have a continuo part which is either more apparent or less apparent. Maybe it should be transparent or apparent. You choose your style, you add what you feel is appropriate to the context as it goes at that moment. It may never be the same twice. Similarly, on the melodic lines, which we're going to hear in the next sample of a Bach symphonia from the two oboists, you're given a very skeletal line. The 18th century player would have been trusted, in fact, would have been expected in many contexts, to have done what he felt was suitable to that line, embellished it, added notes to it, altered it very subtly and entirely impromptu, so you would never get the same performance twice. We can show you this being built up in layers, which I think explains the system and the degree of freedom. First of all, by a small quotation from the very basic version. This comes from the opening of Cantata 156. Here are the first two measures, exactly as Bach wrote them, with no additions or embellishments. It's a beautiful tune in its own right. It is also a beautiful canvas on which you can display your own skills. We have, luckily, some indication of what Bach thought was suitable for application to that melody in a slightly different context. He was an inveterate transcriber and arranger. And from that oboe symphonia, he made the slow movement to a harpsichord concerto. Maybe he trusted his oboist to embellish more than he trusted his own children who would have been given the job of playing the harpsichord part in these concertos. And so he took it on himself to add suggestions for the ornamentation that might, if you so felt inclined, beautify that melody. And therefore, taking that as your cue, you can, if you feel extravagant this particular evening, do something even more impromptu and more elaborate. <laughs> if you feel like it. We'll now build the thing up in layers for you. First of all, from this side, with the almost literal version, as we run through the material again, more embellishments appear. And then on the Chamber Music Society's side, yet more embellishments, some of them drawn from the inspiration of the moment, some of them drawn from the suggestions that Bach has left.
Christopher, at what point does embellishment and ornamentation transform a piece so that you can't call it the same piece anymore and you have to say it's an arrangement or a transcription? <laughs> um, it will always transform a piece, I'm sure, uh, because it sh should never be the same twice. Uh, the point is the piece as you see it on the page is very often the very piece you were never meant to hear. It was just <laughs> it's the, the idea behind the piece. Yes, it's, yeah. the, it's the, the, the matrix on which you put everything else. Of course, if you go wildly outside style, or while the outside box period, then you can make a, a composite piece, a, a sort of neo-baroque You structure. can also, I gather, upset people quite a lot, and I suppose that was behind the title of your lecture yesterday, which was transcription, um, translation or treachery. Yes, Does well, it's, it's uh, traductore, traditore, try to put into English. It is very possible, I think, to uh, denigrate arrangements, uh, simply because nowadays we're so used to the Ur text and we have such access to recordings and because of this wave of interest in authentic performance, one seems to think that an 18th century arrangement of a piece is somehow worse than the 18th century original of a piece. Not at all. I'm very interested in seeing how they relate to each other and what they teach you about the various versions. But what did this gentleman who went around Leipzig and other parts of Germany looking for jobs and, and, and raising 21 children have in mind when he put these things down, did he want people to depart from them and play with them and use them as a skeleton to build on, or did he want his ideas to be reproduced the way he put them down? He was difficult. 
Um, everybody said during his lifetime, he wrote down too much. The performers who liked the sort of freedom we've just heard with an oboe line really felt a bit constrained when Bach chose to write every little nuance into his music. I think it was because he was trying to imitate an Italian style. The Italians were notorious for this uh, flamboyant decoration in a North German environment where people weren't so happy with it and he felt he wanted his way. But on the other hand, he reused his material always. He was forever remaking a, an oboe uh, symphonia into a harpsichord concerto or some piece originally for chorus into some other formation. He, he saw it as very malleable and Bach's music more than anybody else's seems to have all the qualities that enabled it to be transferred from one. So he, he was a transcriber. Medium. He, was, he was a transcriber and a remaker. It was in a constant state of flux. I don't think he regarded one version as an improvement on the other. It was just it was an alternative medium. But he didn't originate this. This, this is a tradition that's shown. Sure. Yes, I mean, um, one could almost say in the Renaissance, more music was arrangement than not. You hit one popular dance piece, of course. And it could become a song, a lute solo, a virginal solo, a consort number, a choral number. It could be used as the bass for other numbers. It was a, 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 every man for himself. What do you think Bach would have thought now of some of the extremely modern arrangements that are being made, like the swingle singers, or the double six, or the electronic stuff. Yeah, I, I'm sure he would have loved them, because in, I mean, he obviously felt his, his music was malleable to an extent that uh, much other music in the 18th century could not be. And he also had this very inquiring mind that he loved new instruments. You find, I mean, he was an inventor of instruments. He was always the man who was called on to try out a new organ or harpsichord when it was built. He was always trying to slip into his cantata scores new instruments that he'd come across the week before, sometimes successfully, I think sometimes disastrously. <laughs> the Brandenburg Concertos are a very good example of him trying to get you know, the utmost from the most novel combinations of instruments, things that, that so rarely were tried by anybody else and so rarely were successful. Well, now we're setting up on stage for something that demonstrates a pretty extreme range of transcription from a solo instrument to a very large ensemble with timpani and organ. Uh, to the point where if you're not really paying attention, you might even find some difficulty in recognizing the one in the other. Yes. Is that about as far as you can go? I think with Bach himself, yes. Uh, these, are both, these are both, these are both Bach both, as both written. By Bach. Yes, in, in the first place he wrote the partitas and uh, sonatas for solo violin for very discreet virtuoso use. It was a, perhaps only for an audience of one. This was very much house music, not oh. public music. Then taking this same prelude from the E major, um, sonata, he added to it all the implicit harmony, as it were. So the organ carries what the violin played in the solo version, plus something to keep your left hand occupied. And the, the rest of the orchestral writing is not a, a world in itself, it's, a, it's purely a support to that sort of idea. Do we know that he did the one before the other? Is that historically clear that yes. the solo comes first? Now, is there implied in uh, all the terrific uh, I was going to say ornamentation, I'm not sure it's the right word, but all that enormous activity that goes on on that one violin. Is all the other harmony that turns up in the larger version implicit within that? Yes. Uh, if you set somebody the job of harmonizing the solo violin version, I mean, as, as Schumann did, he wrote uh, piano accompaniments to all those pieces, uh, you can hit on different solutions. Bass, I think, are particularly good. What is interesting, I think, is, this, is the sense of strain, though, that disappears. Um, the solo violin repertoire is the repertoire that tests the possibilities of, of one violin to their utmost. Yeah. This is very much the Baroque concept of taking an idea and pulling it, almost distorting it, till it reaches the limits of the frame within which it's allowed to operate. And then suddenly you have Bach saying, well, that doesn't matter at all. You know, I can take the same line, we can play it easily on the organ, the two hands can be very brilliant, mm -hmm. because that was one of the characteristics of the uh, prelude in its violin form. It was brilliant, strike it begins enormously high yeah. on the instrument in, in a, a very telling and very trying position for a violinist. I think we're set up now and ready to go back out on the stage and see how this comparison and contrast two extremes really works. Yeah.
Charles, I would have to say that the audience quite correctly disobeyed your instructions and applauded Simon Standage yeah, after the I, solo. I couldn't possibly be upset by something like that, of course, because he played it so magnificently. And the one thing that we want from everyone, music and audience alike, is for them to have a spontaneous reaction to what's going on. And it's, it's marvelous, I think, the spirit of this evening. I want to talk about spontaneity a little bit, especially now that we have Kenneth Cooper with us, and talk about the issue of improvisation, which you referred to earlier, the spontaneous embellishment. And Thanks you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you could the spot very well. <laughs> well, I had to ask myself as I listened to your second demonstration of what might be done, how far away are you, in fact, from an Earl Garner or another jazz pianist who takes a simple melody and says, now folks are going to show you what I'd really like to do? Well, that seems to me that's one of the reasons that we have um, gone into Baroque music, uh, that, that there is a tremendous amount of leeway that the composers of that time placed a tremendous amount of responsibility in the hands of the performers and uh, I don't know we love it is there a, a direct link no let me put it the other way because there obviously is a direct link is there anything that offends you by the jazz comparison or are you and your your jazz brothers really very very close spiritual yes we're close do you agree with that yeah, I've heard you I've heard, heard you cut loose with a few uh, licks on I'll the piano a few licks from time to time which I love and so once in a while I enjoy toying around this but this is a genius both of these gentlemen the way they do it and the, the originality that they bring to it it's wonderful you're a little more severe about the issue of improvisation I understand and you're much more historically oriented to what you can find out about what was in fact played in the 18th century yes I, I think severe only when when you're taking an existing artwork and you then have the responsibility for delivering it up to you know, the public in a, f a fairly faithful form, which is, is, is very rarely going to be the form in which it appears on the page. That would be skeletal. But I think if you, if you are going to go very far outside the field that would have been conceivable to the original creator, then you have to state that you are making 
a jazz transcription of, of which there are many wonderful transcriptions, the same as the Stokowski orchestrations. They, they are a new element put on, the, on top of a, a Bach structure. They're fine in their own right, but they are not... But you don't not, pretend that it's... You can't pretend really that they are, they are a picture of performance practice in Bach's day. But I, I would agree with that. In other words, if you're going to stay within what Bach might have done or might have liked, uh, yes, that's what, what we the aim to do nice historically as well as, as yeah, a and every Yeah, and the nice thing is that there, one used to be terribly, terribly strict about Bach, what Bach would have done. This ornament would have been here and not there. And gradually, as, as people are doing more research, you discover a great freedom within what appears to be a, a, a more and more... Uh, deeply researched areas that you have more scope to. As we, as we get more secure, we're willing to take, take yeah, more risks. One, one knows the subtleties of the little Bach devices. Wanted, I seem to have read somewhere that all of his keyboard music was intended, in fact, to prepare pianists or harpsichord players to be so secure with the instrument that they could then go into any circumstance, take up a few notes handed out from the audience, and improvise. Oh, this was uh, sure. a standard keyboard requirement in the 18th century. You, a keyboard player was a sort of complete musician, nearly was a, a Kapellmeister, would be essentially a keyboard player, probably also a violinist as well, and therefore would have command of all, of all the areas that you had to deal with as a musician. Can I it, want it should be remembered ab about history, as a matter of fact, that what we know about history is, of course, only a small part of what was done, so that when we represent what we know about it, we are distorting it. Yeah. And therefore, to, to try and fill in a little of the creative energy, even if it's not exactly the same creative energy, because mm. we'll never know what that is, we're sort of giving it a little, getting a little closer to a, a fuller picture. That's the wonderful thing, I think, about coming across new versions of, of pieces of or, or new evidence. And suddenly, that gives you this extra energy. Ah, a new, a new set of instructions for embellishment, or a new bark adagio with new roulades in it. Ah, oh, wonderful. We can, we can don't take let this me lose in. Kenneth Cooper before I ask him this. <laughs> I'm wondering if you ever have an experience in improvising in performance, analogous to what I've had occasionally writing fiction, when one of my characters really does something that surprises me, and I see it in my head and, and write it down. Have you had the experience of being astonished? at something that you did or something that you found in your head or something that happened between you and another player? Oh, sure. The, uh, you can't have improvisation without having risk. And once you have risk, you have error. And the thing about a, a master improviser is that if an error occurs, he does it again or in some example. fashion well, turns it makes into something it, very That's nice. right. And uh, so what happened, for example, this summer was I thought we were playing a very uh, poised and organized and charming piece by Johann Christian Bach. And I got out to the concert, and I found the harpsichord was terrific. And I started playing around and doing improvisations, and some of the tunes came out in minor instead of in major. And suddenly, this was a piece that was jazzy, and it was <laughs> you know, spontaneous, and it was a whole different kind of experience. What happens emotionally when you make that kind of discovery? And well, you have to go with it. I mean, you have to, this is now the kind of piece it is, and let's now, let's have fun with this kind and of piece. And you have to be surrounded by people who can also follow you. This That's is the, this is the great people. thing, this is yeah. where, where such specialist groups, this is who all, everybody knows each other, and they follow in the, each in the same philosophy. They can follow that a lead a treat from out. one, and it, it's without becoming excessive. Everybody knows still the parameters within which their ensemble works. You get up to the very limits, and then you draw back and hand over to somebody else. I want to ask both you, Chris, and Charles, if within the purity of your two forms, you being contemporary and you being 18th century, there are some concessions to the other side that you make. You, for example, use a harpsichord instead of a piano. Well, we, all of the people that are performing here are so respectful of what we have learned. Um, we are not, and I, as far as we can divine, are not going against things that Bach would have wished to have done with his music. We're trying the best we can and we're using a, the, at our, the instruments that we have at our command. Uh, the harpsichord for me is best in contemporary, in, in box music because of the sonority. The piano simply does not fit in to an instrumental sonority. It doesn't support in the proper way. And uh, it really, is, it just sounds awful. But a solo piano work played uh, of Bach, that makes me very happy. Yes. We're no less concerned with Bach's intentions than Chris is. Oh, I, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that there's a sort of Freemasonry as it were, that's probably the wrong word to use of, of, of Bach, but I, I think what used to be seen as a great divide between people who were ultimately scholars and rather dusty and rather impractical in their libraries, and on the other hand, real live musicians who were conservatoire. Is it at they, all? They are no longer going in opposite directions. I think, I think we're, we're facing in more and more. It's just a question of to what degree you feel you, you will allow yourself to specialize. To do what we are doing, you have to 
clearly give up playing Stravinsky for in a, a while. In a word, literally, right. is it at all clear which room, which way Bach would have furnished his room if he listened to tonight's thing? Would it be the Chippendale or your awful hole in the plaster? Oh, Bach would be the most uh, modern composer alive today. He'd have loved them both anyway. Bach is Brubeck. I mean, he is alive today, but he is doing exactly what Brubeck is doing bringing up a family, educating them musically, improvising, playing the latest and best form of keyboard instrument. And still doing it two and a half centuries after he died. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are going to take a brief pause, and then I'll be coming back to talk to two of the flottists, the two flottists from the two groups, right after this break. All right, we've been joined by flottists Lisa Besnosiuk and Paula Robeson from the two groups. I, I want to get off the subject for a moment of uh, the ancient mode and the contemporary mode and talk to you a little bit, ask you a little bit about this kind of ensemble playing. Watching both of your groups rehearse these last couple of days, I've been struck by the kind of collegial tone. It's not a boss directing an orchestra like some of the big orchestras I sat and watched. It's a group of people working something out. Is this an illusion or is this really what's going on, that you are, oh. there's a kind of equality and democracy? Yes, I mean, we all have our independent parts to play, so that we all have to, something to say about what we're playing, yeah, and uh, we listen to each other. Yes. <laughs> and, and does that work, does that remain as genial a process as it appears to me, <laughs> or does it sometimes uh, strike a few sparks? Well, sometimes it does. Well, we, we, with, for these concerts, we've been working together for many, many long hours preparing the music, and of course, sometimes it's genial, sometimes it's hilarious. Sometimes it gets very intense, and about two days ago, when we were rehearsing for the Brandenburg Number no. 5, which we'll be listening to in a few minutes. I, I guess I was getting a little bit picky. I do that sometimes. We were sort of going after something and going after something, and finally Fred Sherry, our wonderful cellist, he stood up, and he looked at me, and he had a big smile on his face, and all of a sudden I realized that he was furious at me, even though he had a big smile on his face, and he said, Paula, Paula, we're going to play this? And we're going to play it again and again until we get it right the way we all want it. All right, Paula? And then he sat down and we played it again and again and again. And finally, we got it the way we all wanted to get it. That's the thing about chamber music, which I think is so wonderful, mm. that we all our individual ideas are put into a big melting pot, stirred around, and what we come up with is... You have one more element which is quite interesting in, in the early instrument field as well, that if everybody is essentially an expert in their instrument. Yes. And therefore, when you put an ensemble together, no one person can give you all the technical answers. So no, but that, that's also interesting on the other side, because one would expect a group of virtuosi to be competing for their own place in the sun, and yet the atmosphere oh, no. is very different from no, that. It's no, one no. of where the, the master is not, the master is the work. Yes, so uh, you've got to help each other, to make, each, uh, make each other sound good and accompany each other. That's the nature of chamber music. I found myself thinking as I came in to uh, hear you rehearse the Brandenburg, which I guess we're going to hear next, aren't we, after the break. Gee, do I really want to hear the Brandenburg number five again, one that's heard it so often? And I wonder to myself, how does an ensemble like yours uh, prevent playing such a familiar piece, piece from devolving into ritual? It, obviously, it did not fall into ritual. You were really working at discovering something, but in a piece you must know extremely well. That's right, because the, 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 it was different people playing it. Every time a group changes, there are new ideas from various people in the group. Uh, ideas about a specific favorite section, or a way to view a whole movement, or whether one movement should move slightly. We have endless discuss discussions about the second movement of this piece, for instance, which is marked mm. the fifth waltz, so affectionately, yes. whether it should be grand, whether it should move. So, so that, that yes, it, it's be also because we're playing the music of Bach, which is a constantly changing kaleidoscope of sound. It's so many faceted. And that's why I think it sounds so wonderful no matter what instrument it's played on, whether it's played on old instruments, new instruments, whatever, people singing it. It works because it's such amazing music of such amazing depth and height. His vision was so extraordinary. And I think we, I think we each see a little bit of ourselves in it or want to be with him in his ideas. Well, I wanted to ask you something about seeing yourself and seeing the contemporary world in it. Are you responding to some extent to what you sense about the changing climate of musical opinion and the changing taste so that you reinterpret within a context of what audiences are hearing? And uh, probably slightly. I think it, I a little think bit unconsciously? Maybe, and a bit consciously. I mean, when we play to a very Mediterranean audience, 
you tend to do you Mediterranean the things. The if you're in Germany or somewhere where they're a little bit straight straight laced audience. Do you say that to yourself consciously or do you just no, find it? No, it just happens your, because the audience gives you a feedback always when you play. If they're sitting there smiling and jumping up and down, then you do the same. It's amazing how much an audience can amazing. control a performance. You can you can start off in, in one particular mode almost and because of the feedback you're getting. You, you find you've ended a, a work much more seriously than you began, or with an intention of going on to a, mo a mood that you hadn't anticipated mm -hmm. the next. That's why you, the great beauty, I think, of a lot of baroque music is that it gives you this framework you can adapt. You can all suddenly decide in the slow movement, as uh, Ken was saying earlier, you can suddenly become very florid. It takes off of its own accord because of the atmosphere that's around. Have you been to the Far East? Yes. And did you find that you were reflecting sonorities or ideas or eastern What forms is very interesting there is that you, the, the congruence is between two types of improvising very much. Uh, for instance, you take a, a European lutenist and then an, an Arabic oud player and something like this and, and you see that they are in fact speaking the same language. The, the actual mechanics, the finger work of the instrument is doing a lot that, to supply the framework within that which that music can move. And the idea of anything being spontaneous I think appeals very much to a, a non-European audience invented on the spur of the moment. A last question, Christopher. In the midst of all this collegiality and spontaneity, what is the boss actually doing out there? What is the artistic director in the case you mean of... mean Bach? You're talking about Bach? No, no. I, I think mean, the, I just think Bach is, is the boss. The yes. boss on this one. Okay, Bach. Um, what are you doing? I think I'm probably acting as umpire, but I, I, and, and often it seems to me uh, the whole ensemble is one of umpires, and you're putting up ideas for auction, and if the majority will buy them, that is tried out. It's a, it's a sort of laboratory situation a lot of the time, particularly with the early instruments. You are all trying within certain rules of the game and within the express conditions of those instruments to find the most convincing path to the real meaning of music. Thank you all. Thank you. We're set up on the stage and it's Brandenburg Concerto time and uh, I can assure you it's not a ritual. Far from it.
We have an encore for you. Yay! 
both groups are going to play the little last movement, the Badineri from Bach's B minor flute suite. Now, after much discussion back with our scholars, we have found that the best translation for Badineri is fooling around. Now, <laughs> the, again, please hold your applause until both groups have played the work. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. This program was made possible by grants from Exxon Corporation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.